Next up, because GT Hill stole uh, half of her session, it's going to be a 20, uh, 20 minute session from uh, Alexandra Gates. And she, um, she used to work at Xeris, where she did an array of things, I, I understand. And uh, now she's at the Aerohive. Alexandra, welcome. All right, I was promised a clicker up here, and I'm not seeing a clicker, the big one. Got it. All right, so hopefully everyone's all hopped up on sugar, and you're going to stay awake for the next 20 minutes. Um, I'm here to talk about the power of 5 gigahertz, and this is a vendor-neutral session, so I'll try to take my marketing hat off a bit. And I was told last week one of my colleagues at WLAN Pros did a power of 2.4 gigahertz session, so I'm just trying to mix things up and keep everyone on their toes to make sure you have all the information you need. So of course, most of you in the room are Wi-Fi experts, or at least know a thing or two about Wi-Fi. So I'll be briefly going over some RF fundamentals, uh, doing a deeper dive into both the 2.4 and the 5 gig spectrum, and then also looking at AC, so what's making it go faster. Of course, it's only on the 5 gig spectrum. And then going over some dual 5 gig capabilities and benefits. So what can you get from those software configurable or software defined radios that some vendors are now offering? And uh, before we get into the, the separate spectrums, uh, of course, again, this is a little bit of a, a different room that you actually know how wireless operates. But most conferences I speak at, you know, everyone needs Wi-Fi. It's a utility now. You have electricity. You have water. You have Wi-Fi. You expect it to work but they have no idea the underlying architecture of Wi-Fi or what even radio frequency signal even means. So just briefly, uh, wireless transmissions are made up of RF signals or radio frequency signals, and they're governed by properties that we learned probably in our eighth grade science class with the, the wave on the, the chalkboard, wavelength, frequency, amplitude, phase, um, and they're affected by a lot of components. So things like absorption, reflection, scattering, free space path loss. Um, and these are all the components that make us give the very precise answer of it depends when people ask us how much square footage or access point can cover. So again, there's a lot of uh, underlying architecture and components into wireless that most people don't understand, but we want to make sure that we as wireless experts or wireless um, knowledge holders, we're sharing with other people to make sure they understand everything under the hood and not that it works or it doesn't work. So of course, in wireless, they used uh, one of two radio frequency bands, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So first, to jump into the 2.4 gigahertz band, uh, it's only 83 megahertz wide. So depending on the country, you have between 11 and 14 channels in this 83 megahertz, um, but only three of those are non-overlapping. And there are also a lot of non-802.11 devices that are operating in this spectrum that contribute to the interference issues that we experience here. Things like microwave ovens, uh, garage door openers, baby monitors. So it's a pretty messy space. Um, but there are three usable channels, and that's very valuable in wireless. So we want to make sure that we're still taking advantage of these. So I'm not going to be up here bashing the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, because again, there's three usable channels. We want to make sure we're taking advantage of them. Um, but it is a bit hard to work with in the high density environments we're seeing now. So in a channel reuse pattern, I think I have a, a laser on here. This would be a, a proper channel reuse pattern. You 6, 11, 6, 1, 6, 1, 11. Um, but a lot of times in high density, you're turning off 2.4 radios because having them on is increasing interference. It's going to be lowering your throughput. It's going to be dragging down your network. And unfortunately, you see a lot of examples. Here up on the screen, we have channel 1, 2, 3, 4. Hotels are especially uh, bad at this. If you use a Wi-Fi inspector in a space, sometimes you see, OK, on the first floor, they're using channel one. Second floor, they're using channel two, channel three, and so on. Um, and I was told WN Pros last week was horrible in terms of the, the channel planning. Um, so again, when you're in a high density situation, which most wireless deployments today are considered high density or at least medium density, it's difficult to find a channel plan that's going to work if you have all of your radios turned on to 2.4 in each access point. So that leads us to the 5 gigahertz band. 
There's multiple bands for use in this spectrum. So we have uni one, two, two extended, uni three. Um, the channels are about 20 megahertz wide each. Again, depending on country, you have between 23 and 25 usable channels in this range. Um, and the good news is they don't have the overlap that you have in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. There is some sideband carrier frequency overlap, but it's nothing, it's not as extreme as in the 2.4 gig, gig spectrum. Um, DFS is required to utilize all 23 or 25 channels, which a lot of people have touched on already at the conference. Uh, most client devices do support DFS channels, so we encourage you to use them if possible. But even if you're eliminating the DFS channels, you still have eight or nine usable channels in five gig, which is already triple what you have available in the 2.4 gig spectrum. So just a visual representation of what it looks like for the five gig spectrum. You can see, of course, there is overlap, but there's enough separation that all of the channels are usable and you can use those for channel planning. So with that, um, and there was speakers today talking about this as well, typically 2.4 gigahertz is used for coverage whereas five gig is used on the capacity side. And the recommendation has been made multiple times today to plan for capacity. So therefore, you should be planning with five gigahertz radios. Um, 2.4 can cover more area, can penetrate walls better. That's not necessarily a good thing anymore. We don't wanna just blast power and cover as much area as we want. We're gonna overload the capacity of an access point faster than you know, the amount of space it can actually cover. So why five gigahertz? There's less noise, it's always a positive. There's more channels, which means we have the ability to bond channels, which isn't always necessarily recommended or a good thing, but we still have the ability, which means higher data rate and higher throughput. These are all positive things for our networks. Um, and this goes hand in hand with the need for speed. We've gone through the evolution of Wi-Fi, multiple speakers have already covered uh, so just, you know, very basically, the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum is focused on BGN. The 5 gigahertz spectrum is supported by AN and AC. Uh, specifically with AC, the 5 gig spectrum is the only spectrum it depends on. So this is where we're getting the benefits in the 5 gig spectrum with AC. The fact that we do have the ability for wider channels. Um, I always compare these to lanes on a highway. With 2.4 gigahertz, you have three lanes. With five gigahertz, you have 23 to 25 lanes. That's a positive thing. And we also have the ability to utilize more spatial streams, up to 256 QAM, and of course, multi-user MIMO, if it actually is gonna work in the real world, would be five gig only at this point. So what does this all mean? Of course, this is a lot of uh, marketing stuff up here, wave one, wave two, um, but you know, bottom line is it increases the possibility of data rates. Um, and it's gonna increase your throughput. And you can only take advantage of these tools right now in the five gig spectrum. With AX, we're obviously gonna see some changes, but for now, if you wanna be bonding channels, using three or four spatial streams, um, possibly using multi-user MIMO, that is only available in the five gigahertz spectrum. And of course, you've seen this as well, there are some new proposed unibands and channels, hopefully coming. Um, I don't, I probably don't have any more information than anyone else in this room in regards to this, but adding to that already 25 available channels, it's gonna be another positive in the five gig column. So hopefully we'll look forward to those. So this is what you typically see with an access point and what we've seen for the past 10, 15 years with access points. You have one radio fixed in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, you have one radio fixed in the five gig spectrum. Um, most times people are turning off 2.4 gigahertz radios because again, there's just not enough usable channels. Um, and nowadays with, I think it's over 50% of devices shipping are uh, AC capable, so five gig capable, and even more N obviously. Um, there's not a mix of clients anymore that's equal to 50-50. Roughly 80, 90% of clients are now five gigahertz capable, so why are we still stuck with this mix of radios and access points? So what a few vendors are doing now, um, so it's not just an Aerohive thing, there's other vendors in the industry, is giving you the ability to switch over that second radio. So you might hear it be called software configurable radios or software defined radios. So you can transition, let's see if I can go back, that radio one or radio two, doesn't matter what you're labeling it as, one of them over to five gig. And there's a few reasons that you might wanna do that. So some capabilities and benefits here. 
And a high density solution, this would be a fi fixed five gig radio pattern. When you introduce 2.4 gigahertz radios, oftentimes people again are disabling quite a few of those and sometimes even two out of every three 2.4 gig radios turned off to lessen the interference. So now what if you're able to convert those radios that you would have previously turned off over to five gig? And it's not a hard and fast rule that we're saying to do this, but the ability to have that flexibility is the positive that I'm mentioning here. So you can convert one out of three over to five gig, two out of three, you can use some in sensor mode, um, but you're not turning off half of your access point anymore that you've already paid for. Just building out that channel plan. And then on the channel planning side, of course, um, people have talked about this again, what do we recommend for high density, medium density, especially when you're using a dual five gig AP, we're always gonna recommend using 20 megahertz channels when you're using your, uh, setting up your channel plan. Normal density, you can still utilize some 40 megahertz wide channels. Low density, again, potentially up to 80 megahertz, it depends on the situation. Uh, we were looking at the spectrum here and the Marriott's actually using a lot of 80 megahertz wide channels. I don't know if you have favorable impressions of the wireless here or not, but they are utilizing, utilizing 80 megahertz in a fairly high density situation. So it's really gonna depend on the unique environment. And then of course, if you have an area that's single access point in the middle of nowhere, go ahead and take a, advantage of 160 megahertz, but it's hard to find somewhere that, that's actually gonna be usable. Um, I was doing a webinar last night for Australia and New Zealand contacts. And I know their environment is a lot different. They have a lot more remote areas. So again, the answer is typically it depends. You need to know what their environment looks like, what the interference sources are, um, and what the, the spectrum looks like, both inside the building and outside the building, in order to determine what um, amount of channel bonding you can take advantage of. And then of course, you wanna use DFS if you can, um, unless a specific critical client does not support it. So some visual breakdowns of the channel bonding as well. I think I like the third one best. So why are we encouraging you not to use 80 and 160 megahertz channels? We've seen charts up there, but I think this is a great way to look at it visually. When you're using the 20 megahertz wide channels, again, depending on country, you have up to 25 different channels to choose from when you're planning your network. And of course, when you're in convention halls and anywhere that you need to put an access point every 20, 30 feet, you're gonna need as many channels to work with as you can. When you bond to 40 megahertz, you're already down to 12 channels effectively that you can choose from. Up to 80 megahertz, you have six. So now you're getting closer to the 2.4 gigahertz availability of channels. And 160, you have either one or two selections for which channels you wanna use. So again, I think this is a great way to look at it. Every time you bond a channel together, you're effectively losing an actual channel to use in your channel planning map. So you wanna make sure that you're optimally bonding or not bonding, depending on what you need um, for that plan. On the design guideline side, um, again, we encourage you to enable DFS if possible. And when you have a dual five gig radio running, and this is just an example from our management platform, other vendors are probably gonna look similar. On radio one, radio two, within a single AP, we're gonna recommend a non-DFS channel with a DFS channel. Um, and that's, you know, if you have a client that does not support DFS, it's still gonna be able to connect and pass traffic on that access point whereas you also wanna to try to use DFS channels as well so that you're taking advantage of more of the spectrum. So what are some of the benefits here? And again, I'm not trying to sell a specific access point model, um, but just the idea that you have the flexibility to choose between spectrums when you're purchasing an access point. And of course, I've already touched on this. Uh, the first is ROI. So you're spending six, seven, eight hundred dollars on an access point. Why are you going to disable half of that access point? So again, instead of turning off your 2.4 radio, you have the flexibility to convert that over to another spectrum that you're actually going to be able to use. Second one up here, um, high density implications and the increase in overall capacity. Because 802.11ac only uses the five gigahertz spectrum, if you wanna take advantage of those data rates and that full capacity, you need more five gigahertz radios. Um, and having two of them on a single access point is gonna be a, a positive thing uh, without having access points every five or 10 feet in order to reach the capacity you need. Third point up here is less interference. Anytime you eliminate 2.4 gigahertz radio is probably gonna be a, a good uh, step in, in terms of lessening interference. 
And again, with five gigahertz, you have between 23 and 25 usable channels. So there's just gonna be a lot less interference. And again, there's a lot of non-802.11 interference on the 2.4 gig spectrum. So you're just lowering that, bottoming it out on your network. And then the fourth one up here, uh, future-proof investment. You might need a 50-50 mix of radios right now. Again, I don't know, it depends on your environment. But in a year, maybe you're gonna convert that to 60% five gig radios, 40% 2.4. In three years, maybe you'll have a 75% mix of five gig radios, 25% mix of 2.4. It's up to the customer, but the fact that you can edit that mix as needed, I think is a benefit. So it's good to look for the vendors that do support these, either again, software configurable radios, software defined radios, just to take advantage of all five gig has to offer. Um, and once again, not saying 2.4 gigahertz is dead. Sorry to anyone that, that supports that as well. There's three usable channels, but there's only so much that you can do with that amount of channel space with the amount of high density deployments that we're seeing today. So we're giving an offer here. I know there was some fights about this back in, I think it was February in Phoenix, um, about if dual five gig access points actually work. Um, so we're offering a free access point, the AP250, which is one of our software configurable models that you can try out and a switch in your own environment. Um, so again, if you're one of the skeptics that say that's not possible to do in a, a single access point, you can follow the link, which we'll be sending out this uh, slide deck. So it's free AP. There are some rules. You have to have a business address. Can't be a competitor. Sorry. Um, you cannot be a paying customer. But it's just to get you know, the actual gear into your hands, see if it works in your environment, um, test it out, try to break it. But we've put some pretty cool stuff into it, as have other vendors. Um, so again, we think this is kind of the way of the future with software-defined networking, and specifically on the radio side. Uh, so we want to make sure that everyone's able to test it out in their own environment. And that's it. Still have three minutes. If there's any questions? If I can see anyone out there. Back. Yes, so there are recommendations and then also with the uh, channel selection plan that's inherent in most vendors management systems, there's gonna be a recommendation of what the channel separation should be. Go ahead. Excellent. What's the output power? I'm not sure what it's set to in ours. So anyone, David? <laughs> What's the output power in our five gig radios maxed out to in Hive Manager? <laughs> David says lower power is better. So again, evading the question there. Well, according to Devin, max is 10, so, yeah. Thank you. So yeah, based on the client capabilities, the management platform is going to encourage connection to one radio or the other, depending on what the client's able to do. All right. 